It's a great privilege to introduce uh, our friend and colleague from Southern California, Dr. Tajillian, who's a clinical professor of otolaryngology and also uh, uh, engineering at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, so he's agreed to join us today and talk about uh, vestibular migraine. Uh, he has an active research program in uh, many different areas, is an inventor, has uh, worked on many different devices. So today he's going to talk with us about uh, migraine, one of the areas he's uh, spent quite a bit of time in. So thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Bill. This is uh, truly an honor and privilege uh, to speak um, at your Grand Rounds. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, migraine in the ear, uh, not just on vestibular, we're going to talk a little bit more about other stuff too. So uh, my disclosures are unrelated. Um, these are all devices and stuff that we're developing, so none are related. Um, I think uh, aside from traffic, this is actually, uh, I think the 110, uh, this is uh, on the left is um, what traffic normally is, and this is what, what it was a couple months ago. I think it's picked up a little bit since then, but I think the only very, very few benefits of this has been, I think, dissemination of knowledge. Um, I've certainly uh, learned a lot by logging into uh, the House Grand Rounds, uh, as well as other meetings that are now being held online. So, so um, we're just first gonna briefly talk about what really migraine is. So um, everyone thinks of migraine as a headache problem, but really migraine is essentially a baseline hypersensitivity of the brain. There are lots of neurotransmitters involved, uh, starting with glutamate and serotonin, histamine, CGRP. It essentially starts as this uh, cortical depression. So it's a decreased electrical activity in the brain, which then uh, spreads within the brain and then leads to activation of cranial nerve five, which then can cause changes to um, the distribution of cranial nerve five, which leads to headaches um, and changes to the inner ear, as we'll talk about, and uh, central vestibular effects, which gives us a lot of the symptoms that we see with migraine in, uh, in otology and neurotology practice. This, <clears throat> this is actually uh, from a, uh, an article that was um, written by uh, Fred Nuttall and his group um, when he was at Michigan. Um, so this basically what they did was they labeled the trigeminal nerve um, in animal. Uh, so here, this is the trigeminal nerve. They labeled it and then they looked to see where the label uh, they could find. So they found it around the basilar artery, the ICA, um, the spiral modular artery. Um, so here it is, uh, here, spir spiral modular artery, and you have the labeling, which is the, the black around the blood vessels, and very intense labeling on the striovascularis. So there are branches of V1, uh, so the ophthalmic branch uh, is where this, is, this was labeled, um, that go all everywhere uh, in the cochlea and the vestibule. So um, what they did was they uh, stimulated then in a subsequent uh, study, uh, stimulated the trigeminal nerve with uh, electrical stimulation and with capsaicin. And what they found was uh, depending on the degree of stimulation that was given, you had within about 60 minutes, a significant amount of fluid extravasation within the cochlea. They looked at the cochlea only. And so you can see here on the, the figure in 0.1 milliamp, um, so this is, this is control, this is the, uh, the stimulated, and uh, 0.1 milliamp got this much, um, and one milliamp got this much fluid extravasation. And they looked at the concentration of this um, Evans blue that they had sort of injected. So um, theoretically, uh, we can see that it, stimulation of trigeminal nerve can cause an increase in fluid extravasation with within the cochlea, which can potentially lead to some of the things that we see that we associate with um, an increased fluid in the ear, which could be something like endolymphatic eye drops, uh, Meniere's disease, 
um, or even BPB, as we'll talk about a little bit later. So in the general population, migraine is relatively common and a significant portion of people with migraine get vertigo. So about three to 5% of the general population gets vertigo as a result of migraine. Um, when we compare that to the prevalence of Meniere's disease, which is about two in 1,000 people, uh, you can see that uh, very, very conservatively, um, about for every 20 patients with um, vestibular migraine that we should be seeing, um, we should be seeing one Meniere's disease. So um, our sort of diagnosis should be uh, within that uh, ratio approximately. Now, of course, um, referral patterns alter and stuff, but in general, there should be a lot more vestibular migraine than there is Meniere's disease in the general population. Um, and a lot of patients with migraine who get vertigo get those uh, vertigos during times where they don't have headaches. So you don't have to always have a headache that is um, associated with the vertigo for it to be vestibular migraine. So many of the symptoms of atypical migraine involve the ear, um, just like there are several uh, atypical migraine symptoms that involve the eye that have you know, named entities like auras and whatnot. Now, a lot of patients with migraine don't fulfill the International Headache Society uh, criteria for uh, a migraine headache, but they have a lot of the symptoms that are associated with migraine. And the kinds of symptoms that we see in an otolaryngology type practice is uh, the neck spasm or stiffness, especially at one-sided, um, the complaint of um, quote-unquote sinus headache. Um, you know, they say I, it hurts behind my eyes, it hurts to move my eyes. Um, they say that, well, I don't get headaches, I just get stress headaches or I get caffeine headaches. Um, and what these really are, they are just essentially mild forms of migraine, uh, which, you know, for the purpose of doing uh, clinical trials and stuff, they're not included as part of migraine because, um, you know, they want very, very strict uh, definition for it. But those really are part of the same phenomenon. They are, they are the trigeminal nerve uh, activation. There is a trigeminal nerve symptom. It's just milder symptoms than what we associate with the quote unquote migraine headache classic migraine headache. Uh, people who say they get, I get sinus infections whenever I'm in front of an air conditioner or when there's weather changes. And you know, I tell patients, you can't get sinus infection from an air conditioner. You, you can get a migraine from an air conditioner, but you don't get a sinus infection from an air conditioner. So cold air blowing on the face activates the trigeminal nerve and it can lead to symptoms which then can be interpreted as sinusitis because it's usually around the forehead or the maxillary sinuses. Uh, people would say that they get dizzy when there's weather changes or there's too much sound. And these are patients, of course, who don't have PLF or superior canal deosins, et cetera. Uh, people who had multiple sinus surgery and still get quote unquote sinus pain. Um, you know, they say they get better after surgery for a few months and then, then the pain comes back. Uh, and that's because you just cut out a whole bunch of nerve endings. They're not going to have pain for a while. And then those nerve endings grow back, it takes about six months, and that's what happens. So what are the triggers for migraine? Uh, probably first and foremost, it's uh, stress, and that could be uh, psychological stress, like anxiety, uh, et cetera, which is most commonly probably anxiety is the, the biggest uh, uh, psychological uh, trigger. And then, but physical stress is also uh, the same thing. So the brain reacts in the same way, whether they have psychological stress or there's physical stress in the body. So somebody has significant pain or they have an upper respiratory infection, that is all interpreted as stress uh, for the brain and the same reactions occur, which can lead to potentially uh, migraine type symptoms. Um, hormonal changes, uh, especially around menopause is when we see
Uh, I believe you are still muted, Dr. Jillian. You mean? To, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, I tried. I, I, I did it with the phone, so it's more reliable than the internet. But of course, that cut off. Um, so most commonly, we see it around menopause time, and so it very commonly, the average, uh, you know, migraine type patient we see is is a is a 50 year old uh, female uh, because that's when uh, approximately menopause occurs most commonly. But you can see it around menstrual cycle time, hormone replacement therapy, contraceptives. And in men, I've seen it with testosterone supplementation as well. So um, other triggers probably, I think second most common after stress is sleep. Um, and sleep could be most commonly, it's too little sleep or interrupted sleep, but um, it can also be from too much sleep. So you sleep too much um, uh, some days and don't sleep the, that same amount than other days, you're going to potentially get migraine on the days you sleep longer. A shifting sleep schedule, probably the most common reason for a migraine in, in children and um, young adults is they sleep in until 10 on weekends, and then they wake up at 6 a.m. on the weekday. And um, as a migraine sufferer myself, I did this for many years um, until probably the uh, middle of medical school and not realizing that this is actually the cause of a lot of the symptoms I was getting back then. So um, other things we see is shift work, um, people who travel a lot in jet lag, um, head trauma or intracranial surgery. So any irritation of the dura uh, can potentially trigger it. Um, so usually we're talking about more significant head trauma. Um, surgery or dental work, so anything that stimulates the trigeminal nerve. So um, we see this a lot of times. People say, well, all of this started after my dental work. Um, probably after, uh, I would say, uh, stress and sleep. Probably the third one is diet in terms of uh, common triggers. Um, there are three parts to the diet, which is hunger, uh, dehydration, and then the food items. The food items are really related to primarily these three molecules, which is histamine, glutamate, and tyramine, but other things including caffeine is another significant trigger. Um, I tell patients basically tyramine is, is a byproduct of protein breakdown. You will find it anytime you have protein that sits around a long time. Now, that could be um, something that's like aged, uh, like a cheese, for example. It could be something that gets um, fermented, like alcohol, um, or it could be food that sits in your fridge for a week um, or any kind of processed meat, uh, things like that. Now, glutamate is the primary component of uh, MSG, mon monosodium glutamate, which is a preservative. It's in all sort of the pretty much all ready to eat packaged foods. Um, it is a natural compound, so we'll say natural preservative on the food packaging, or I'll call it um, uh, hydrolyzed protein products or autolyzed yeast. Those are all uh, euphemisms for MSG um, so that uh, people sometimes who don't buy products with MSG will still buy them. Um, and then histamine is something you see in some fruits and uh, in uh, nuts, uh, so nuts are uh, one of those potential triggers. So people come and say, oh, I have a very healthy diet. It's not from my diet. And I tell them it's not a healthy, unhealthy diet. It has to do with these molecules. And these molecules are in healthy things like bananas and citrus fruits and stuff like that. And the last is uh, certain stimulations. And uh, the stimulations that can trigger migraine, the headaches are you know, commonly are lights and sound. Um, but uh, sound can also be a trigger for vertigo in people, and these are these patients can some, present very similarly to PLF and superior canal deacens. And I've had several patients who've had uh, superior canal deacens surgery, um, and they continue to have the, the problem. And when you look at their pre-op imaging, um, they really didn't have superior canal deacens. They had thinning, but not full deacens. Um, and surgery is done, and of course, no, they're not better because they're, the underlying problem was really a migraine phenomenon. And we treat their migraine and they get better. So um, it was vertigo, intense sort of, or repeated, uh, or certain types of head motion. They say, when I look up, I get, I, I get dizzy, for example, 
or I look down, I get dizzy. But when you look at their eyes, they don't get nystagmus. It's not BPD. Um, uh, the second, probably most common for vertigo, is visual motion. And these are people who are sensitive to motion in their visual field. So they're scrolling on a computer screen. Uh, they say, I can't go to a 3D movie, um, uh, you know, or reading and scrolling on a phone, walking and reading on the phone. Those are things that are very stimulatory um, to our VOR system, which then can lead to activation of the migraine phenomenon. I myself um, am very sensitive to visual motion, so I can't play video games, uh, for example, for more than a minute or two. Um, weather changes is another thing we see. We probably don't see it as much in Southern California because we don't get uh, too many uh, low pressure systems. It's low pressure system that causes. But in the Midwest, when I used to uh, practice in Chicago, people will come and say, I can tell when a, when a storm is coming, um, uh, usually a day before, because there's a low pressure system, then the, the clouds move in and then there's a storm. In Southern California, we see it with cloudy or rainy weather. So there's always an uptick in a lot of migraine uh, patients in January, February uh, in my practice. And um, we see it with the Santa Ana winds, with the, um, which again is a low pressure system. Um, intense smells the potential trigger. Some people are sensitive to ambient heat. They get overheated, they'll trigger their migraine or cold air on the face like air conditioner, as I mentioned, and intense exercise. Um, these are things that you might hear from patients. So think of migraine if you, the patient is talking about light or sound sensitivity or innocuous noise or innocuous light causing, they say, even if it's cloudy, I got to wear sun, sunglasses. Um, they're sensitive to motion. They're visual fields like they say uh, going to a supermarket I get dizzy or windshield wipers, wipers make me dizzy etc. Um, childhood or adult onset motion sickness is one of those things that's uh, definitely a migraine related phenomenon so uh, they say oh, I never had motion sickness but recently I started to get motion sickness now so, um, that should trigger you to think about uh, migraine and sometimes people describe the space in motion discomfort where they say they go from an uh, open space to an enclosed space, and that will trigger their dizziness, or uh, going from an indoor space to an outdoor space will suddenly uh, set them off. Um, and people sometimes can have really excessive nausea as the only manifestation of their migraine. So uh, again, think about the migraine when you hear that. Of course, anyone with nausea, I will send them for a full GI workup and a neurology workup, but assuming all that turns out to be normal, we uh, treat it as migraine. So in, uh, from an R standpoint, if you see patients with um, otalgia, um, where they, get, they say that they have ear pain associated with wind in the ear or dizziness or headaches, um, that was described by Michael Taishido, um, and it, uh, it's a migraine-related phenomenon. Uh, oral pressure, pressure in the ear that doesn't resolve with valsalva, uh, or if they you know, have had a myringotomy or a tube in the past, and it's not a canal dehiscence of any kind. Um, that's a migraine-related phenomenon that uh, we published a couple of years ago. Quote-unquote sinus headaches. Um, uh, there was a nice study, this was back in 2004, that 88% of patients with chronic sinus headaches um, had migraine. Um, and these are people who get repeated scans and they're normal. And sometimes people do surgery for these with like a two or three millimeter uh, mucosal thickness. Um, and that's just, that's not sinusitis. You're not going to get pain for a, a one millimeter thickness of uh, sinus mucosa. Um, low frequency or fluctuating hearing loss. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, many ears, uh, I think if you think somebody has many ears, they, they probably have migraine. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so dizziness with loud noise, but they don't have the, the, the phenomenon that we associate with this. If somebody has recurrent BPD that doesn't respond to EPLI and their MRI is normal, think of migraine. Um, patient has uh, vertigo and their MRI is negative and they don't have BPD, most likely they have a migraine phenomenon. Um, of course, you know, as I said, they, we don't dismiss everyone and say, as you have migraine, but we do a full sort of history and exam and uh, if necessary, testing uh, an MRI on everyone. And if all that is normal, uh, then, uh, or it doesn't point to anything suspicious, then migraine is really what's causing the problem. 
Um, you probably have seen this where you do a Dix Hall Pike, this patient says, oh, I'm very dizzy, I'm very dizzy, but there's no nystagmus. Um, and those are, again, uh, likely migraine uh, patients. Uh, the uh, significant nausea and vomiting after epley maneuver, uh, again, these are migraine carriers. Um, they might have BPV to fix the BPV, but that, um, that uh, nystagmus stimulation ca causes a migraine episode. I just had one yesterday. We had to sit in the office for an hour afterwards, um, and we have to give her some Zofran and Decadron, et cetera, to get her to feel better to go home. But she clearly had BPV, but she had significant nausea and vomiting after um, uh, the Epley maneuver. Um, immediate nystagmus on dix Hulpike, again, in the absence of an ab uh, abnormality on MRI should make you think. So patients say, well, I've been doing the same thing forever. Why do I suddenly get this? Um, and so I, I try to describe this to them as, as this phenomenon. So there's a threshold in the brain and the, uh, the brain uh, electrical activity sort of goes up with these various stimulations like stress and hormonal changes and poor sleep. And you know, it may get very close to that line and uh, the diet is sort of what pushes them over, or it's some other thing that, that sort of happens last will push them over. So before every episode, I tell them when you get an episode, you got to look, look back six hours. That will tell you what happened that pushed you over. And you know, in this case, I'm, I've drawn it as if it's a diet phenomenon. So they go up and down, they will get better, and then the brain wants to go back to its normal, but then they'll trigger it again, and they go up, and then they will get another symptom and then down and then they're fine and then up and symptom. And then, then eventually with either spontaneously on its own or with um, trigger control, the patient's brain activity goes back to its normal state. They'll be eating the same stuff. They'll sort of get these little bumps. They'll never reach threshold and they'll never get symptoms. So this is the reason they, they were eating the same stuff and they, were, they weren't getting symptoms. And this is now they're eating it and they're getting symptoms is because other things have occurred. And we see a lot of times sleep apnea as being one of the uh, factors, a major stressor or um, uh, hormonal changes around menopause. Now, if you have frequent enough a uh, trigger, then you can get a continuous migraine. So people say, well, this can't possibly be migraine. I've had these symptoms for six months in a row or a year in a row. And in the same way, you can get you know, a so-called status migranosis, which is a continuous headache. Um, you can get a continuous um, ear migraine, and that could be uh, vertigo. It could be other things that we'll describe, like pressure and pain, et cetera. Now, prophylaxis um, is what really pushes the threshold up, um, and uh, trigger control is what brings the, elect the electrical activity down. So ideally, you want to combine the two of them. I mean, you should be combining the two of them. Um, so patients come and say, well, I tried all the medications. They don't work. It's not migraine. And I said, well, did you do, did you watch your diet? Did you, you know, do correct your sleep? Did you work on your stress? Did you do all that stuff? And so, no. Um, well, if you don't do that, if, if you're sufficiently above the threshold, by just moving up the threshold, you're not going to get improvements because if you're still above threshold, you're still going to get symptoms. Now, people can have multiple thresholds, so they can have a headache threshold, so they they get headaches, and then sometimes the migraine gets severe, and then they'll get vertigo um, at a later point. Now, when you do, um, uh, when you uh, give them medications, you push up. So sometimes they say, my headaches got better, but I still get the vertigo, for example. And it just all depends on where these thresholds are, and that's probably a epigenetic factor and um, a much more difficult problem to figure out, uh, which we're hoping at some point we can work on and figure out. Anyway, um, let's go back to uh, the, the initial onset of Meniere's disease. So Meniere's, as you know, um, was French. He wrote four papers back in the 1850s. Um, he described uh, these phenomena. And I think what happened probably, of course, as you know, Meniere's disease was named after Meniere had died. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure if everyone went and looked at his papers. So we actually went and looked at his papers. And um, this, uh, this is, we looked at his, uh, his papers that were in French and, uh, and then a, a translation that had been done uh, in the past as well. So um, this is exactly what he said. So he said these cerebral states called migraine give place in the end to similar attacks 
and the deafness which arises in these circumstances would seem to be inevitably related to a disease of the same nature. So these, he said these phenomena that these patients are getting is, is a migraine state, but it ends up causing deafness. He thought that this was maybe a different form of it. And then this is another um, sentence from his paper where he said, we believe that it can be asserted that many so-called migraines are only the index of a morbid process leading infallibly to deafness. So Meniere himself recognized that, that these patients that he described initially had uh, migraine. But I think what happens a lot of times, um, and we see, uh, is, is sometimes people don't go back to look at the original um, actual papers. Um, so we then started looking at uh, patients uh, with definite Meniere's disease and um, we looked at to see how many of these people um, had uh, the, qualified for the International Headache Society um, uh, migraine, classic migraine headache with or without aura. And 68% of our Meniere's disease cohort had that. And then when we looked at the other 32%, um, they had uh, family history, they had uh, features of migraine or uh, which is things like um, ice cream headaches and uh, et cetera, motion sickness, um, and that sen sensitivities, which I'm sorry, that uh, motion sickness is part of the sensitivities, which included three of these, which would be light, sound, or motion, um, uh, three of the, the six that we listed here. And uh, your current fellow, Hussein, was uh, our resident, uh, worked on this paper too. Then we looked at these patients um, with a different group of many years disease patients, and we treated them uh, with just migraine regimen. These are all patients who'd been treated with diuretics before. Uh, they came to us, and then we started them on uh, either nortriptyline or verapamil, and then uh, added topiramate if they improved. And we used the many years disease quality of life survey um, that was developed by the Michigan Ear Group. And we found that 92% of them uh, improved. They went from an average of eight episodes per month to 0.6 episodes on average uh, post-treatment. Uh, and we found that really that um, they respond very well to migraine. And this was not, uh, this. they just purely followed everything related to migraine and nothing related to many years. Although, of course, as you know, there's some overlap. Um, and the vestibular nerve section, uh, which is a couple of papers here you can see, um, gets about the same results as we got um, uh, with the uh, quality of life surveys. So, you know, we believe really that before doing any kind of destructive uh, procedures, uh, we should consider uh, giving the migraine uh, therapy. Um, then we started uh, noticing uh, that a lot of patients coming in with other phenomena had a lot of uh, features of uh, migraine. And so we started looking at our group with Mal de Barkman, and we started treating those patients with um, uh, the same uh, migraine protocol. Uh, we used the historical control group um, that was treated with physical therapy uh, before I really understood the link between these two conditions. That's what I would do in the past. Um, and uh, you can see the or, uh, majority are female and the mean age was 51, which is around menopause time, as you know. And um, in our uh, sort of treatment group, the average uh, intensity of symptoms on a zero to 10 went from 7.6 to 1.8. And the control group had a, a minor improvement and we had a pretty good follow-up on these patients. Uh, and these have gotten a little thrown off. But basically uh, what I wanted to point out is that these patients had, a lot of them had motion sickness. So 72% uh, on motion sickness, um, they, uh, a history of quote unquote sinus headaches and 72% of them and 72% uh, fulfilled uh, IHS criteria. Um, then we started hearing a lot of the same stuff from patients with hyperacusis and we started treating them with migraine protocol, looking at then historical controls that we used to treat with progressive broadband noise uh, sound therapy. Uh, in our migraine treat, treat, treatment group, we did not use um, sound therapy. And CALFA uh, questionnaire is a, um, a questionnaire that was developed for um, hyperacusis and normal is uh, less than 27. Our treatment group went from 32.6 to 22 
in our control group uh, did improve, but it still was actually within uh, the abnormal range. Now, other kinds of things that we've noticed over time, um, as I mentioned, oral pressure uh, being one of them, we, uh, our initial paper um, uh, was actually 11 patients because we wanted a very, very pure group of patients who had had nothing um, related to dizziness or any other things or uh, hearing loss, et cetera. So that was a very pure group. But if you actually look at patients who present with oral pressure, they have a completely normal tympanogram, normal exam, um, and they say they don't get better with Falsalva, they don't have canal deessence, they don't have any kind of mass or tumor, then migraine is the cause. Um, and so we had, when we looked at these patients, again, 54% of them had a history of migraine headaches. Uh, when we treated them, they significantly improved. Um, and a lot of them had visual motion sensitivity, again, a very prominent feature of migraine. Pediatric dizziness, I mean, we don't see too many of these, but if you do see pediatric dizziness, think migraine. Of course, everyone gets an MRI. If they get an MRI is normal, uh, their exam's normal, then migraine is really it. Um, this is actually a patient we recently published, a patient who presented, this is a five-year-old uh, who had recurrent episodes of uh, vertigo, had a low-frequency hearing loss. Um, so it really fulfilled the, the definite uh, many years of these criteria. And um, all we did for this patient was we just purely changed her diet um, to a migraine diet. Um, it really told the parents to enforce the sleep regimen that say the child sleeps on the same schedule, increase hydration, and just gave her magnesium and uh, riboflavin, vitamin B2. And um, we saw her, this, this hearing loss had been present for six months. Um, and so when we, she came in, her hearing was back. She'd had no vertical episodes um, two months later. And I saw her uh, recently, about a year later or so, um, and still symptom-free. She gets stimulated a little bit when she goes to birthday parties because there's a lot of jumping up and down and a lot of sound and um, eating uh, kinds of foods she shouldn't be. But other than that, she actually is doing very well. Um, uh, some of the patients that we've seen with post apodectomy vertigo, these are patients where we've essentially ruled out everything else. So they've had a blood patch, so we inject blood to, to close off any uh, PLFs. Uh, their CT is negative. They don't have superior canal deessence, and we just treated them with a migraine regimen, uh, and they all uh, resolved. Um, uh, we looked at a population of acoustic neuroma patients who had vertigo as their sort of most prominent feature. And I try, try to explain to the patient, if you have episodic vertigo, it's probably not from an acoustic neuroma. A fixed lesion cannot cause episodic symptoms. So uh, seven of these had migraine uh, vertigo, which all resolved with medical treatment. Um, and uh, out of the nine patients, um, only two ended up needing uh, treatment uh, because two of them grew the arrest we observed. And in the past, you know, we would have operated on these patients or because we would have said vertigo doesn't get better with radiation um, and therefore uh, and we can't observe you because you have vertigo, so we're going to do surgery. And you know, with treatment, we, we saved a lot of these patients from uh, getting intervention. Now we're going to shift gears to hearing loss. And um, hearing loss is, is traditionally not been associated with migraine, but uh, I want to, to tell you that there is actually a significant association with it, and we'll go through the evidence here. So this is actually looking at a very large uh, database of um, 45,000 patients with migraine and 180,000 with a control group. And they found that the migraine patients were 50% more likely to get sudden hearing loss. Another uh, study uh, looking at a 10,000 patients of migraine of 41,000 of controls found that there was an 80% chance of developing sudden hearing loss if you had uh, migraine. Now, migraine and sudden hearing loss is, is not a new phenomenon. It was um, uh, described by Herman Jenkins and New Coker back in 1987. Um, they had a case report of a recurrent sudden hearing loss with migraine headache. Um, now, uh, a couple of years ago, um, a, a paper came from uh, Taiwan uh, that described a recurrent um, hearing loss, um, usually low frequency. There's no history of dizziness, but there could be uh, other 
types of uh, symptoms that would be suggestive of migraine. Um, this is the actual paper. Um, we had actually observed this for years before. Uh, we just hadn't actually written about it. Uh, so they asked us to uh, write an editorial about it. Um, and so Harrison and I wrote this. But um, basically, migraine can cause hearing loss. Just um, we have to just be looking for it a lot of times. And if you look at your sudden hearing loss population and what they come in describing, you will start noticing that there a lot of them have uh, migraine features. Not all, but a lot of them do. So uh, a couple of years ago, I started treating all our uh, patients with sudden hearing loss um, with adjuvant migraine prophylaxis medications. So everyone gets uh, oral and intratomatic steroids like I used to do uh, in the past, which is that group of 47. And then I started adding uh, a combination of nortriptyline and topiramate um, together from the beginning. And um, we, this is actually our results. It just recently got published, um, or actually it's uh, EPUB right now. It's not published yet, but it's uh, available online. Um, and this is the uh, IT and oral steroids and their degree of improvement in various frequencies. This is the group that got the migraine prophylactic medications in addition to our uh, oral and intratopanic steroids. And we match these by the degree of hearing loss and, and all the other stuff. And you can see that there's a significant difference in the low frequencies in terms of improvement of hearing uh, when uh, an adjuvant uh, migraine medication is used. So on average, they did about 10 dB better um, when, when it was combined. Um, this is actually a, a patient um, that came to me, for example. So um, this is a, had a sudden loss uh, on 326, was treated with intratympanic and oral steroids by an outside um, otolaryngologist. Um, I saw her about a couple of weeks later. Um, she had the same uh, level of hearing. She had no word discrimination here. She had no word discrimination when we saw her. She said it just sounded like thumping. And all we did for her is we started her on nortriptyline and topiramate and saw her about six weeks later at nortriptyline 75 and topiramate of 150. Her low frequency had substantially improved and her word discrimination at a level of 75 was 100%. Um, so we actually started looking at um, patients who presented to us with a sudden hearing loss that was uh, more chronic in nature. And so we looked at um, patients that just were at least a couple months out and a median of uh, four months out and a, a mean of about seven months out. There's a group of 21 patients. This is currently under review. Um, and uh, a lot of them had a fullness sensation or had a current headache. And that usually tells me that when, I, when they describe that to me, that tells me that there's an active migraine process occurring. And so um, if I, I thought to myself, if we could just control the migraine, maybe the hearing would get better. And this is the regimen I use for, for hearing loss with uh, migraine. I, I usually go a little bit more aggressive on the nortriptyline and start at 25. And every two weeks we'll go up and uh, topiramates will start at 25 and once a week go up to at the six week point. We'll see them if they don't get better, we do um, two intratympanic steroid injections. We got 14% of the patients who returned to baseline. And these are patients who'd had hearing loss for months. Um, uh, ward discrim improvement um, of greater than 15%, we saw in 54%. And 33% of patients had for, went from a non-cervical serviceable hearing to serviceable hearing. Um, and the mean uh, ward discrim improvement was 35%. This is uh, an example of one of the patients she uh, first presented uh, to us back in uh, 2015. This was her hearing three months prior. So pretty much exactly the same as what we saw. Um, and her word discrim was 32% back then. It was 32% with us. Then um, all I did for her was put her on nortriptyline and uh, topiramate. She didn't want to go up on the topiramate too much. She had little side effects. So we, and, and the same for nortriptyline, but that's all that was needed. Uh, and her work discrim came up to 80%, and she started using a hearing aid, and she was very, very happy. Um, so how do we treat migraine? Um, the 
most important thing, as I said, is trigger control. And that includes uh, lifestyle changes, uh, adherence to the diet. Um, and what we do is I tell patients, I don't know what food item is going to be your trigger. So we have to do, eliminate everything. And then we will add things one at a time until you, you, we can identify what, what is causing your symptoms potentially. Now, sometimes it's not diet at all. And it could be just um, stress and, or sleep. But, and so we need to address those at, uh, at the same time. So I tell people to eat on time. And we've seen a lot of migraine from this um, intermittent, intermittent fasting. Uh, that's kind of a new fad. Um, I tell them to drink lots of water during the day. But I tell them to refrain from drinking water for three hours before bedtime because uh, that will make them go to the bathroom often in the middle of the night, and those disruptions are not good for the migraine process. Um, I tell them to sleep the same schedule, no more than an hour of change between uh, this, um, their schedule from day to day. If there's anything on the exam or history that warrants, uh, you know, that there might be sleep apnea, I'll check a sleep study. So I check a lot of sleep studies. Um, and we find a lot of sleep apnea in these patients. Um, and then, you know, if we don't fix the sleep apnea, it's almost impossible to correct the migraine. Um, I have not been able to, um, to help these patients with just medications alone, unless the sleep apnea has been under control. I tell them to do things for stress reduction, and I give everyone uh, vitamin B2 at 200 BID and magnesium uh, at 400 BID. Magnesium oxide is more commonly available in, in pharmacies and stuff, um, but magnesium glycinate causes less diarrhea. So if they get diarrhea with oxide and they cut it in half, they still get it, I'll switch them to glycinate. But most often they have to buy that online or from a vitamin store. Now, from a medication standpoint, I generally don't use abortives. Um, it's very rare, and the very first time somebody's getting symptoms, I'll, I'll give them an, a, 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 you know, sumatriptan um, if, to see if that will potentially stop their symptom. But generally, if somebody comes in with recurrent episodes or chronic uh, vertigo, triptan is not what you would want to do. I do use prednisone because prednisone is actually a very good migraine abortive. And um, I usually use, a, depending on the severity of symptoms, between a half to one milligram per kilogram um, for five to seven days. If they get better, I usually will um, uh, just stop it. Um, if they don't uh, get better, I will continue with the seven days full and then we'll taper it out. Um, so this I've used if somebody, uh, patients comes in and says, I have this vertigo, I have this major um, interview or major trip or a wedding or whatever I have to attend to. And I just need to get better like ASAP. So I'll put them on prednisone for the duration of whatever they're supposed to do, which is I, no more than a week plus the taper. And then, um, then I say, okay, once you're off and you're, if, if you're better, which most often their symptoms come back, um, then I will just start them on prophylaxis at that point. So Really, prophylaxis is the, the more important and really more effective way of uh, treating this. Uh, it should be combined with trigger control because, as I mentioned, uh, there is a threshold and there is a brain activity. And if you're far above and just move the threshold up, you're still going to be above your, your, uh, your uh, threshold and you'll still have symptoms. So you have to combine it. And uh, so patients come and say, well, I tried nortriptyline. It didn't work. And I said, well, did you try nortriptyline with your diet? and this other stuff. And I said, if we didn't do it, we got to do it again because nortriptyline is probably one of the best drugs for this. And I don't want to just dismiss it because you took it and, and it, you, had, you didn't get better because it's a, it's a full package deal, as I tell them. So um, it, we have to sort of help with, with them and with the migraine as if we help them, then their sensory amplification, their sensitivity to motion and stuff like that gets better. Um, so I don't use the suppressants like meclizine. It's not even on my um, commonly prescribed drugs on my uh, EMR system because it's so rare that I use it. Um, I only use it if they're going to go on a trip or something, and I usually will use um, a scopolamine patch rather than meclizine. Um, so generally speaking, nobody knows why any of these things work um, except for anti-seizure drugs. 
um, which which stop the, the spread of the cortical depression. But why nortriptyline works and why verapamil works, really, we don't know. Um, they all kind of work about 70 to 80% of the time. Uh, they do take some time to work because we have to kind of escalate the dose slowly. People with migraine tend to be very sensitive to medications. Um, and so there is a little bit of an art to this. Um, and, and it's sort of not as easy as here's your diazide, um, you know, uh, take this for six weeks. Um, uh, it, you have to kind of do a little bit of playing around with it because patients do get side effects. You have to kind of go down sometimes uh, by one step and then go up in half steps. So various ways you can do things to help, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So nortriptyline is probably my most common go-to drug. Nobody, as I said, knows why it works, but it does affect, it's a central antihistamine, uh, and it is norepinephrinergic, and it, is, it works as an SSRI and an SNRI. Um, it does cause somnolence, so I give it usually one or two hours before bedtime. Um, if they're very sensitive, or they say, oh, I'm very sensitive to meds, I start them on the liquid uh, nortriptyline, which is, uh, you can give them five milligrams or even one milligram if you wanted. I've had patients who get better with just a tiny dose of nortriptyline. Um, so, but generally speaking, I start at 10, um, but sometimes if the patient's in a hurry, I'll start them at 25, um, or for sudden hearing loss patients, I'll start at 25. If they have any kind of arrhythmia history, I tell them, go ask your cardiologist to make sure it's okay because nortriptyline does cause a little bit of QT interval um, uh, increase. And then some people can cause a little bit of uh, tachycardia. Um, it's really best for patients who have significant sleep and stress issues. Um, those are the events that you, know, uh, you see. And um, you, know, you see these patients who come and they're crying in the office, they're really upset. And those are the ones that nortriptyline would be the way to go. Um, alternative is amitriptyline. It causes more somnolence, uh, but the dosing is the same. Uh, if I decide to go above uh, uh, 75 or decide to keep them at 75 for a long time, I do get an EKG uh, just to be sure. It's really just for um, CYA purposes. Um, if there are already high dose antidepressants, um, I will not use it generally. And high dose antidepressant, I would consider a four times uh, starting dose. Um, now, I next uh, sort of uh, if they have stress issues, but nortriptyline is not going to be a good option for them uh, because of various reasons, um, like cardiac history, et cetera, I'll use uh, paroxetine, which is Paxil. I start five milligrams and go up to 30. The top dose for uh, Paxil is, is 40. Um, I don't use it, again, in high-dose uh, high antidepressants. Um, the uh, calcium channel blockers or verapamil is the one I use most commonly. And for some reason, verapamil works better than amlodipine. So I've had patients who are on amlodipine. They don't have improvement. Um, they're on it for blood pressure reasons. I will switch their amlodipine to verapamil and their uh, migraine gets better. Um, the dosing regimen I start with is 120 um, and I go up by 60, so 180 and then 240. Um, every two weeks is sort of my general uh, dose that I go to. Uh, Verapamil comes in a sustained release form, and you want to use the 24-hour version. There's a 12-hour version as well, but use the 24-hour. I've gone up as high as 480 on Verapamil. Verapamil does uh, decrease a heart rate and blood pressure. So if they have a low heart rate blood pressure and Verapamil is like the only drug you could use for some reason, then you can start at 20 or 40 milligrams. An alternative, if they have a low heart rate, but have a high blood pressure is Candice Hartan, um, which I start at four, and every two weeks will escalate to 32 milligrams. So anticonvulsants, um, I, um, as I mentioned, is probably is, works on the cortical spreading depression, at least based on animal uh, studies that have been done on it. Um, the most common one I use is topiramate, um, which I start at 25, go to 150. Topiramate can, in some people, I should say not topiramate all, anti seizures can cause uh, some cognitive uh, side effects at, at the higher doses. So people think that say that they, they can't think as clearly or they're just mentally a little slower. People who do like public speaking, like attorneys um, and stuff like that, I generally will use topiramate uh, as sort of the, my last uh, group of meds that I will use uh, because 
you know, you don't want somebody in a courtroom and they just can't have work finding difficulty or something like that. Uh, gabapentin is an alternative. Uh, if they're on gabapentin, sometimes patients are a lot of times on it. I'll just escalate the dose instead of adding a second medication um, to their regimen. Again, people who have a lot of cardiac issues, I will, um, the anti seizures are the way to go. Um, I do use acetazolamide. It's a, a, a acetazolamide, which has been used for uh, many years disease, actually has a very good anti-migraine effect, and most likely the anti-migraine effect of it is what really helps many years disease. Uh, and that's the dosing regimen I use. I don't use beta blockers as much, but I do use it sometimes in patients who have stress issues. Um, uh, so I will combine it with something like nortriptyline. So I give them nortriptyline. If their heart rate goes up, then I'll give them um, and propranolol uh, usually started 80 milligrams, the long acting version, increased by 40 every two weeks. I don't use these as often, but there, there is evidence for, uh, supporting both of these for migraine. And propranolol actually has an FDA indication for migraine prophylaxis for headache purposes, of course. Um, the side effects are, are as noted. Uh, um, you don't want to use it in diabetics or asthmatics or someone who has significant depression because that can potentially worsen it. Um, so what I generally start with is I start with nortriptyline most commonly um, if there's sleep or anxiety issues. Um, if there is hypertension and there isn't as much sleep issues or stress issues, I'll give them verapamil. Verapamil does make people a little tired, so I do pretty much all the drugs I give are, are given at night. So all the side effects will occur during their sleep or at least most of them will occur during their sleep. Um, I, you gradually increase until they're better once they're better, we keep them at that dose for about three months, and then we'll taper them off. Um, if they have cardiac meds, then uh, paroxetine or uh, topiramate are the ones that I use most commonly. And they have to continue the diet lifestyle changes and then start reintroducing foods once they're better. Um, so sometimes what you have to do is make their symptoms intermittent. So then with the intermittency, you can identify the trigger because I tell them if, if you get a symptom, uh, look back six hours and you can figure out what, what triggered it. Look at your diet, look at your hunger, etc. So why do people fail? Um, sometimes uh, people start too high um, and the patient gets side effects and then the patient says, oh, I'm not going to take this drug anymore. And they just tell them, just be patient with me. Just let me do my thing. Go, we'll go back one step. We'll go slowly and we'll go up. And I've had patients who get side effects at 25 milligrams of nortriptyline and we go back to 10 and then we can take them all the way to 75 um, and they have no symptoms from it. It's just, they just have to get used to it at a, starting at a lower dose. But patients sometimes are in a hurry. They're like, I wanna get better ASAP. And so you, you, you have a tendency to sometimes start them a little higher dose um, and, and, and end up kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so escalating too quickly can sometimes cause side effects. So it's sometimes you wanna go slower um, escalating a too large a dose. So you sometimes got to um, spread these out in smaller increments. Um, the, of course, the patients can be non-compliant. And at least in Southern California, we have a lot of people say, I just want to do everything natural way and um, I don't want to take medications. Um, so that is unfortunately something we have to contend with, but there are a good number of supplements that can be used. So aside from magnesium and uh, riboflavin, I do use butter burr sometimes um, and uh, fever few um, and sometimes melatonin. Those all have um, evidence supporting at least for migraine headache. And I've had patients with uh, vertigo or other forms of migraine where they had improvement. Um, really probably one of the most common causes of failure is the patient is not doing what they're supposed to be doing in terms of their sleep and diet, et cetera. So I will get a sleep study if they're not getting better and they say they're following your diet. I tell them, bring your di uh, diary in, diet diary. I have a, a nurse practitioner and a physician assistant who help me with this, these patients. So they sit and look through these and if there's any question, I'll look at them sometimes. Um, but that sort of uh, is the way to, to, to figure out what's causing it. So I had a patient who's an engineer and said, you know, I'm very meticulous with my data and I know I'm not eating anything and there's nothing that's triggering this. I said, well, bring me the data. He brings this big Excel sheet. And I said, well, it looks like every time you have a ham sandwich, you're getting your vertigo episode three hours later. I mean, it was that obvious to me, but he obviously didn't see it. So 
sometimes just looking at these things is, it makes it very, very easy to point out what's, what's occurring. Um, so they could be, um, again, overstimulating themselves. There, there might be major life stressors that you can't fix. So I've had patients who, you know, they live with a spouse who's got Alzheimer's or um, they're in a very difficult situation in their life. And it's really hard to fix those patients. And really, they, you do need help from psychiatrists and psychologists sometimes. Now, quote unquote, invasive or surgical treatment, I, would, um, I don't do these very often, but um, we do have a cohort of actually five patients who had purely pressure sensitive vertigo. So these are patients who will get uh, vertigo primarily with driving uh, to the mountains in Southern California. Um, some of them were my patients uh, in the Midwest who would get them with uh, storms. And uh, they would have PE tubes. I had a patient actually who moved to California from Kansas um, because every time there was a storm, she would get vertigo. And she came to me and I said, you know, what's your trigger? And she said, well, it's the, it's the storms. And I moved to California because of this. So I just put PE tubes in her. Uh, so that takes away their, her ability to sense pressure changes. And she stopped having vertigo and she moved back to Kansas. Um, so that was actually pretty interesting. Uh, Intratympanic steroids, I do use, um, even if there's no hearing loss. Um, because the same phenomenon that intratympanic steroids, at least based on animal studies, changes blood flow. Um, to the cochlea. And so if, if you know, uh, that's what's helping patients with Meniere's disease who happen to have hearing loss and have vertigo, then it should work for uh, vestibular migraine too. Does it work for everyone? No, it doesn't, um, but it does work for a good number of people. So I do use it um, in the same Meniere's regimen. Um, and in lymphatic sac surgery, I probably do one every, you know, certainly several years. Um, and that's really when we've exhausted everything else. Um, I don't generally do it for uh, purely uh, vertigo episodes. Um, usually, I want to make sure that they have the um, the hearing loss component to you know call it many years. Uh, so I have done it. Do I do them often? No, maybe once every four or five years. So migraine is really the primary cause of many forms of ear disease and probably a vast majority of vertigo. Um, the, uh, think of migraine, the patients who come in with uh, ear pressure, otalgia, sudden loss, um, acute or chronic, quote unquote, sinusitis, where, you know, you look at their brain MRI and you see all their sinuses are clear. Um, and so, you know, they don't have sinusitis, but they have sinus headaches. So think that's probably a migraine phenomenon. Um, a lot of times patients don't have uh, headaches, but they will complain of neck stiffness. and um, uh, we have a, a paper actually that's in preparation on looking at neck stiffness and the side that, that they have symptoms of uh, in uh, in our cohort. And the neck stiffness tends to correlate with the same side. So they they have it's, a, it's just essentially like a headache. So they're getting a neck stiffness instead of getting a headache. Motion sensitivity that I talked about the headaches don't doesn't have to be there. I don't even ask about headaches uh, as much anymore. I will maybe say. Do you have any headaches, migraines, or motion sickness? Sort of, I just, it's part of a group of things I'll ask them. But I, I don't ask an extensive headache history um, because if, if the suspicion is high, they don't need to have a headache for me to know they have migraines. Um, and we talked about all the other stuff, which is the lifestyle changes that are really key to this. Um, the supplements uh, is the first step, and then screening for OSA. And then learning prophylactic treatment, I think, is valuable in, in, in allowing us to help the patients.